All right, we're uh, after the hour, so I don't have a full hour's worth of material, but I'm going to get started anyway. Well, so by way of introduction, <laughs> my name is Brant Carlson, and I'm a faculty member here in the Physics and Astronomy Department. I study lightning, which is not necessarily something you'd think of if I said, name a branch of physics. You probably think, well, particle physics or astrophysics or cosmology or something. Um, the forefront of knowledge, the way we usually describe it, is this sort of unbroken boundary that is always being pushed forwards by the, the high-profile science projects like the Hubble Space Telescope or CERN. But there's a lot of gaps, and there are a lot of gaping holes if you start looking closer. And lightning physics is one of those holes. Despite really having been studied for hundreds of years, we have only a vague notion of how it actually happens. So that's going to be the topic of my talk. If you've seen lightning recently, and since it's March, you probably haven't seen lightning recently, but it probably looked something like that. A single bolt coming out of the cloud and going down to the ground. If you're lucky enough to have been a little closer, or to have taken a picture with a slightly better camera, it might have looked something like this. Do I have controls for the lights here? What's nice about taking pictures like this is, while you do see this single bright channel, this is typically all that's visible to the naked eye. There's actually a whole lot more going on here. You can see there are branches going off in all directions, and potentially some stuff happening even aside from the main branch. If you happen to get really lucky and take a photograph where you can see where lightning actually strikes the ground, these are really hard to find. This is actually from the cover of the Bible of Lightning Physics, Lightning Physics and Effects by Vlad Rakov and Martin Newman. Uh, I love this photograph, because you can see how when the tree here on the bottom gets struck, it's sort of illuminated from the inside. Lightning is not a very big phenomenon. The channels here are actually really only a few centimeters in diameter, if that. So it's a very intense, very local sort of thing. There's a lot of things going on here that I will come back to later on, but already you're probably getting a feel for the richness of the behavior of lightning. Now, still photographs are only part of the uh, part of the picture, of course. Uh, even better than still photographs are movies. And this is a, a movie taken with just a normal video rate camera, and it's going to loop. You can see it's not just that the channel suddenly appears everywhere equally all at once. It's appearing and then sort of growing gradually as it extends. This isn't the end of the story either, though. We can do a whole lot better nowadays than just simple video frame rate cameras. We can take high-speed movies, and these are movies taken by Tom Warner, who uh, has done a lot of really spectacular movies. I uh, highly recommend his website, ztresearch.com. There are a lot more videos like that here. This is what lightning looks like when you see it at 7,000 frames per second. So there's that initial burst of activity, and you see a great deal of branching as the channels extend outwards. And once it reaches the ground, the whole thing lights up, and the camera frame is completely saturated. Let me show it in a, a slightly more sped up version. It's a little, it looks a little more fluid this way. I always feel compelled to make sound effects when I see this. <laughs> you, of course, can't get sound effects when you have a high-speed camera, because there's no way to sensibly make audio under these circumstances. But there's a, a vast array of processes happening here. To pause it, this is just after the whole process got started. And this is, in theory, a single channel. And it looks like it's sort of looping around and tying itself in a knot. Uh, it's not going in a straight line. It's not really a single channel. It's branching. And if I wait until it gets all the way down to the ground, and I think I can advance frame by frame here, watch this guy. This is the channel that meets the ground first. Once it reaches the ground, the whole channel lights up, but it lights up starting from the bottom first. And then if I go another frame, of course, you don't see much. If I keep going after that, you can see these channels off to the right, which were relatively boring a few frames ago, are now quite bright once again. So. Um, lightning overall, I think, is a really fascinating topic, and there's a lot going on here, obviously. And, well, 
The fact that we have no freaking clue what's going on here is perhaps unsurprising given the vast uh, variety of things that you can see happening. I've cut this movie off after six seconds. It keeps going. Uh, the actual pro discharge process here is really only a small piece of the picture, especially if you consider that what you're looking at here is really only the bottom kilometer of something that extends for potentially hundreds of kilometers. This is a map now. The main panel in this is showing a north-south versus east-west, sort of a virtual top view of a lightning discharge. This is now uh, data taken with a lightning mapping array. Essentially, it's a passive radar that listens to the electrical noise a lightning discharge makes. And it listens carefully enough that it can infer where the electrical noise is being produced. And you can actually map out the channel structure. And the scale on this plot now goes from minus 10 kilometers to 20 kilometers in the y-axis, and from minus 30 to 10 kilometers in the x-axis. So this whole thing is maybe 40 kilometers from end to end, with hundreds of kilometers of total channel. If you're looking at the high-speed video and thinking, oh, that looks kind of similar, keep in mind that the high-speed video here, now looking at a side view, would really only be looking at the bottom few hundred meters to a kilometer of the channel, the part that comes down below the base of the cloud. So really what you're looking at in that, vo in that movie, interesting and, and uh, exciting though it may be, is really only a tiny portion of the total process. So that's a um, broad sort of overview of things. There's a very famous quote by the physicist Horace Lamb, who studied, among other things, fluid mechanics. Um, he said, I'm an old man now, and when I die and go to heaven, there are two matters on which I hope for enlightenment. One is quantum electrodynamics, and the other is the turbulent motion of fluids. And about the former, I'm rather optimistic. Even in the context of being able to know everything, he was more optimistic about the mathematically abstruse theories of high-energy particle physics than he was about something relatively simple, like turbulent fluids, which is something you all are familiar with if you've ever taken a bath. He might as well have been talking about electric discharge physics, the physics of lightning, if you will. It has the same broad range in scales, the same broad range in properties, and the same broad range in fundamental physical, um, well, fundamental physics behind the whole thing. So overall, the outline of my talk is going to focus, for the most part, on the phenomenon of lightning. We don't really understand a lot of the phenomenon of lightning, which means I'm also going to have to tell you about the things that we don't know. Some of the problems in lightning physics. As an attempt to address some of those problems, I'll tell you a little bit about some current research. My, my current research as well as some others. And I'll spend a very brief moment talking about the future of where I see this field going in the future. First of all, context. Lightning happens in thunderstorms, and thunderstorms fundamentally are powered by an updraft. What it means to have an updraft, you have a large mass of air, moist air in this case, and as it rises, it cools, and as it cools, water droplets condense. The condensation of water is essentially the inverse of sweating, whereas sweating cools you down. In the case of a quantity of air rising upwards, it's actually heating the air up. It's adding energy to the air, which makes the air tend to rise more, which tends to make more water condense in sort of a positive feedback effect. This is the sort of turbulence that Horace Lamb was talking about, not really being able to understand. At any rate, the updrafts in thunderstorms like this can be extremely intense. Uh, we're talking wind speeds in the vertical direction of somewhere around the range of 50, maybe even 100 miles an hour. Um, really fast wind speeds, especially if you're thinking about something going up. Uh, if, there are anyone, if there's anyone in the audience interested in hang gliding or paragliding, they call this cloud suck, and uh, it tends to be deadly if you get caught in a cloud. The updrafts are much more intense than anything that you would look for if you were trying to be lifted up in, say, a hang glider. This really gets us to problem zero of lightning physics. We know a little bit about how thunderstorms like this work, but we don't know how they electrify to begin with. Our best guess as to how this happens has to do with the inner workings or the inner environment inside this updraft. Inside an updraft, you have a, a wide variety of materials. You have air, first of all, but you also have water. And water comes in a variety of forms here. It comes in liquid water, supercooled liquid water droplets, ice crystals, snowflakes, hailstones, gravel. There's all sorts of different things. Um, you can think of gravel as sort of a, a proto-hailstone. And the bottom line is you have heavy particles, like gravel, and light particles, which I've drawn sort of like snowflakes, but they're perhaps more likely to look like just little columns of ice. 
the fluffy things are likely to be lifted up by the updraft, whereas the dense, heavy things are likely to fall down in the updraft. And this separation of types of ice, as they collide in this updraft, they end up exchanging charge. The separation of these types of ice after they've exchanged charge then leads to the overall charge structure forming in a thunderstorm. The dynamics here are not particularly well understood. Uh, the analogy I like to use is scuffing your feet on the carpeting during winter. You pick up a charge, and then when you touch a doorknob, you get a shock. Mm -hmm. Except in the case of your feet and carpet, it's two very different materials. We have the rubber in the soles of your shoes versus the, the plastics that the, the carpet is made of. Where in this, whereas in this case, we have one form of water bumping into another form of water. It's difficult to imagine doing anything really chemically to result in, change in, in an exchange of charge. But that is actually what happens. We don't have a full understanding of this, but the net overall charge structure of the thunderstorm is something that we've mapped out. We can send weather balloons into thunderstorms to try and figure out what the charge structure looks like. And what you end up with is positive charges near the upper reaches of the thunderstorm, negative charges in the central region, and a smaller positive charge near the bottom of the storm. In that main updraft, where the bulk of the charging occurs, you end up with the light snowflake-like particles being lifted to the upper reaches carrying a positive charge, whereas the heavier particles fall to lower reaches of the storm carrying a negative charge. This leads us to problem one of lightning. If you look at this picture, and I asked you where would lightning discharges occur, well, it's going to occur between the two big charge regions. If you're trying to remove charge, neutralize charge, it's going to occur entirely in the cloud. The types of lightning, then, pose problem number one for lightning research. The three types of lightning, which are typically called intercloud, negative cloud to ground, and positive cloud to ground. Intercloud lightning is by far the most common. About 90% of lightning occurs entirely in the cloud, between the upper positive charge region and the central negative charge region. So 10% of the time, the central negative charge region ends up connecting to ground. Here you're starting the lightning discharge below the central negative charge region, perhaps in between the central negative and the lower positive. And then a very small fraction of the time, about 1% of the time, less than 1% of the time, the upper positive charge region, especially if the thunderstorm has been sheared over, sees a direct path to ground itself and can itself directly connect with ground. These percentages are rules of thumb. They depend on where on the earth you are, what the local meteorological conditions are like, and probably what day of the week is. But uh, overall, most lightning happens inside the cloud. So getting back to that movie, which is only looking at a tiny fraction of a now 10% of the overall fraction of lightning, and we're really only seeing a tiny, tiny piece of what's happening overall. This leads us to problem two. Given that we have charge structures like this, between, say, the upper positive and the central negative charge region, how will the lightning discharge ever get started? Well, the lightning discharge doesn't really get started on its own. It needs a little bit of a boost. You obviously have to have a very intense electrical environment, which we have inside thunderstorms. But every time we have sent a weather balloon into a thunderstorm to measure what the electrical environment is like, it hasn't been able to tell us anything anywhere near what we would expect would be needed to start a spark. The observed electric fields, the observed intensity of the electrical environment inside a thunderstorm is about a factor of 10 too low to ever start lightning. How that might, how we might be able to get around that, and our, our best current guess is that it has to do with something called a hydrometeor. Hydrometeor is just a general term for something inside a thunderstorm. Um, it might be a particle of ice, it might be a droplet of water, something along those lines. And while you might have a relatively boring electrical environment, here shown as green arrows, for instance, the force on a, a free positive charge. If you have something like a little droplet of water, for instance, it will affect the electrical environment. Any polarization of the free charges in that water droplet, for instance, will result in an intensification of the electrical environment near the surface of the water droplet. The shape of the droplet is important. If it's an ice crystal, the shape of the ice crystal is important. The polarization of the material the ice is made of, the presence of any free charges inside the hydrometeor, they're all important. But overall, the most important fact is that if we look very near the surface of the hydrometeor, you see a very intense electrical environment. 
And under those circumstances, fingers crossed, vigorously waving our hands, we can perhaps get an intense enough environment to start making something that would one day grow to become a lightning discharge. <laughs> we're on a very small scale now. We're talking about millimeter scale particles in a thunderstorm. So we're, we're a long way from 100 kilometer long lightning discharge. Let's start small and move our way up. If this electrical environment is intense enough, it can trigger what's called an electron avalanche. Zooming in now on the surface of that heavy meteor, you have, say, a region of, of negative charge. The bottom now here represents the surface of the hydrogen meteor. And above, I've just drawn these crude, I guess they're helium atoms, but they're supposed to represent air molecules. Positively charged nuclei with negatively charged electrons orbiting them. Please don't tell my boss that I drew a picture with electrons orbiting. <laughs> this is just not supposed to do that, right? Yeah. At any rate, if the electrical environment here is intense enough, to say this electron experiences a very strong repulsive force due to this large population of negatively charged uh, ions on the surface of the hydrometeor. Under those circumstances, it maybe will be kicked out. It actually ends up being ripped off of its atom, and once it's free, it can accelerate. As it accelerates, it gains energy. Eventually, though, it's going to collide, and when it collides, it may knock off a secondary electron as a collisional ionization process. The collisions here, instead of having one free electron, you now have two free electrons, which will then again go on to gain kinetic energy, accelerate, collide, <coughs> knock off a second generation, or a third generation, or a fourth generation. What you're left with at the end is a population of electrons running, in this case, upwards, leaving behind a population of ions in their wake. This is the sorts of things that we can actually measure in the lab, and they end up looking something like this. A negative electrode on the bottom, a positive electrode on the top, a very short pulse of high voltage in a cloud chamber, and you can see this sort of, um, sort of process form. What you're looking at here, the whiteness, is due to condensation of water droplets on residual ions left behind after the electron avalanche has propagated past. This is still on a millimeter sort of scale. But it turns out that these electron avalanches are not the end of the story, of course. We have to go up to, to still larger scales. The electron avalanches themselves, for instance, if you consider this electron avalanche, you know there's going to be a large population of electrons near the end of this avalanche. That large population of electrons can act very much like the large population of electrons near the surface of the hydrogen meteor and can trigger a further generation of electron avalanches. These avalanches can then sort of grow in chains, and these chains of avalanches can become self-sustaining in a, a sort of process called a streamer discharge. <coughs> streamer discharges are now looking on a 10 centimeter scale. We're getting bigger, but still not big enough. Streamer discharges are in and of themselves a very interesting phenomenon. It's actually more than just a physics problem, it's a chemistry problem as well. These are two photographs taken at the Technical University of Eindhoven by Sander Needham, one of my colleagues. And he's done experiments in, for instance, nitrogen and argon. And these are like analytical grade 99.999% pure gases. And you can see just by looking at them, these behave very different. Mm -hmm. You don't see nearly as much branching or these sorts of feathery like structures in nitrogen as you do in argon. So we've got chemistry involved now. I'll try not to swear. If something like this were happening continuously, it wouldn't look like these nice branch discharges. These are very short timescale processes. If it was happening continuously, as driven by a, a direct current, sort of a constant impulsive force, we would call it St. Elmo's fire, if you've ever heard that term. St. Elmo was the patron saint of sailors, and uh, sailors would notice these sorts of glows coming from the tops of their masts of ships at sea. Um, you really can't see it, but this is on the right-hand side here is a photograph of St. Elmo's fire as observed uh, on the top of a chimney, uh, like an industrial complex. But you're looking at something that exists on a, a centimeter to meter scale now, and it's large numbers of chains of avalanches. We're on the right track, but we're still not entirely there. We're working with streamers now, and streamers are not the same thing as lightning, though they may look sort of similar. This is a high-speed photograph taken, again, at the Technical University of Eindhoven. This time, we're looking at a, a one-meter scale spark gap, driven by a one-megavolt discharge. Before the discharge has actually started, you see a lot of streamer-like processes like this. Before the, before the spark discharge actually develops, we have streamers, and the transition from streamer to spark, or from streamer to leader channel, is one of the main problems. Problem three in lightning physics. 
how do we go from streamers, for instance, as would be emitted by a hydrometeor in the intense field region of a thunderstorm between the upper positive and central negative charge regions, how do we go from that to a full-scale lightning discharge? Streamers don't really leave behind much of a channel, whereas sparks obviously leave behind a very intense channel. The temperature of a streamer is really the same temperature as the ambient gas. We're talking a few hundred Kelvin, whereas the temperature of a lightning leader channel, or a spark, is hotter than the surface of the sun by a good, by a good margin. We're talking about 30,000 Kelvin, if not higher. And then the currents carried are vastly different as well. A streamer discharge is a small sort of millimeter scale process that only carries a small amount of charge, whereas making and sustaining something like a lightning channel means you need thousands of amperes of current, a good factor of a million higher in scale than what you would get out of a streamer. So how do we make this transition? That's a good question. We don't know. Perhaps delaying the question a little bit, I can ask a follow-up question. Suppose all of this somehow magically happens, once again vigorously waving our hands. Suppose we had a leader channel, how would it extend? The extension of a leader channel is something that we can observe in the lab. Uh, the same sort of lab as I showed you those photographs from the Technical University of Eindhoven earlier. You have a high voltage electrode on one side, the grounded electrode on the other, and what we're looking at now is sort of the early stages of the development, the, the St. Elmo's fire stage, only on a much more intense level, since it's being driven by a much more intense process, namely a Marx generator, instead of just wind blowing on a, a wooden ship. If I step through this, this cloud of streamers, though each individual streamer is utterly insignificant, together they can effectively heat the gas in the background. And once they've heated the gas to the point where free electrons are being just thermally ionized from the gas, the gas itself, start, itself starts acting like a conductor. Once the gas starts acting like a conductor, you don't have an electrode connected to St. Elmo's fire. You have an electrode connected to an effective conductor produced by a channel of ionized gas connected to St. Elmo's fire. This fan of streamer discharges is essentially heating the gas near the base of the fan the channel behind it is heating itself by supplying the necessary energy to continue to drive this fan of streamers. And this process can continue gradually, where gradually is used in the sub-microsecond context, but eventually it reaches the rest of the way across the gap, and you have what most people would consider a spark. Now we're looking at 10 meter scale. This is probably about a 5 meter gap discharge from positive high voltage to ground. This is a relatively smooth process, especially if you're looking at a uh, discharge produced by a positive high voltage. And unfortunately for us, perhaps, lightning is a good deal more complicated than that. The smooth process, the sorts of things that we typically observe in the lab, is not actually seen in reality, in nature. What you're looking at now is, good God, 10 plots. Look, look fast. 10 plots, each showing a measurement of the change in electric field at a particular location as part of the Huntsville, Alabama Marks Meter Array. They've deployed an array of field change meters, and each meter then is sensitive to the motions of charge nearby, where nearby now means several kilometers away in a nearby thunderstorm. On a minus 10 to plus 60 millisecond scale, you see there's a lot going on, and it differs. For instance, station one here saw an overall decrease uh, electric fields becoming more negative, whereas station five saw an electric field becoming overall more positive. But in terms of the smoothness of the process, zooming in and looking at the first two milliseconds just surrounding this initial burst of activity, you can see it's not a continuous process at all. You actually have, in this case, a step, and then another step, and then another step. This discontinuous growth is very difficult to, to explain. And this is perhaps the essence of how, uh, how the lightning channel extends. Once the lightning channel extends, at some point, some 10% of the time, it's going to hit the ground. And that's yet another problem in lightning physics. The process of the lightning channel connecting with the ground is not exactly straightforward either. Propagating and extending into air, that's one thing. Propagating and extending towards something like the Earth, which is, well, complicated, is another thing entirely. This is the same photograph that I showed you at the beginning, where lightning actually struck the tree here. The feature I'd like to point out now, notice how the lightning channel above seems to branch downwards, mainly the secondary channels that exist 
tend to be pointing away from the main channel and tend to be pointing towards the Earth. Look at this channel. It's pointing upwards. This is actually a channel that started from the tree, moving towards the lightning discharge as it extended down towards the tree. How that sort of process happens means you need not only to consider the extension of the lightning channel, but the extension of secondary channels that leave from, for instance, trees coming upwards. And this is a very important problem because if you wanted to design an effective lightning protection system, a good system of lightning rods, for instance, to protect, say, that house, uh, you would care about that. There's actually, you really can't see it in this, but there's a telephone pole here, and there's another secondary channel leaving from the top of the telephone pole as well. So if you're concerned about protecting your telephone system from lightning strikes, which happen very often, you need to care about this sort of thing. Once lightning hits the ground, that's still not the end of the story. This ignition of the channel, which you saw in the, in the movies, once the channel reaches the ground, the whole frame grew extraordinarily bright. That's called a return stroke. But even once that happens, it's still not the end of the story. Still more problems in lightning physics. Return strokes, it's not just that you have one of them, you have many of them. What you're looking at here is called a streak camera photograph. Imagine you were looking at a blinking light with an ordinary camera and taking a time exposure, swinging your camera past the blinking light. Instead of just seeing a light, you would see a dotted line or a dashed line as the light moves across your field of view as it blinks. This is the same process, only on a much shorter time scale, moving the camera on a scale of a fraction of a second instead of on, on the scale of what you would be able to do if you were looking at just an ordinary blinking light. Earlier times are on the left-hand side. Later times are on the right-hand side. So once the original lightning channel here on the left, once it reaches the ground, the whole channel illuminates. This saturated the frame in the movie camera, that I, in the movie that I showed you earlier. Once that goes away, there's this sort of gap to the right of that first return stroke. Past that gap, the channel illuminates again. That's a subsequent return stroke. And explaining why subsequent return strokes happen has to do probably with something happening up here in the cloud. We don't really know what's going on in the cloud. We have very little understanding of what the channel does when it's not doing something very active. So what exactly is going on here is difficult to explain. In this case, there were actually, I think, 13 subsequent return strokes. Typically, it's about four. If you've seen a lightning discharge and were vaguely conscious of a flickering, that's multiple return strokes. So not only does lightning strike the same place twice, it often does so multiple times within a single discharge. Another feature I'd like to point out here, you notice this very long gap here? in between the second to last and the last return stroke. You may see some vague sort of fuzzy regions here. The channel itself was somehow active during this period. It wasn't active in a bursty way though, it was active in sort of a continuous way. Explaining what happens here when we have subsequent return strokes, especially in the context of having both this bursty behavior and this sort of continuous behavior, uh, well, that's problem number five. Problem number six is that we have bursty activity even when we don't have return strokes. This is going back to the data that I showed you from the Huntsville, Alabama Marksmeter Array. In the right, we're again looking at minus 10 to 60 milliseconds in time scale, and we're looking at motions of charge. So if you look at data from detector one, for instance, station one, there was an initial burst of activity when the lightning channel first got started. Then it was quiet for about 20 milliseconds, and then you have a second burst of activity. Then it's quiet for another maybe 10 milliseconds. Then you have a third burst of activity. Then, once again, sort of quiet, but obviously something is happening because you're seeing motion of charge here. This is indicating a motion of charge whenever there's a, a vertical motion in this plot. And then finally here, at around 60 milliseconds, the channel reaches the ground. So all of this bursty activity is happening even independent of the channel connecting to the ground. These are called K-changes in the literature, and it's yet another active problem in lightning. Um, I have my own ideas as to what this might, might actually mean, and I've even been able to reproduce some of its features in simulation, which I'll talk about later. Um, so, to summarize so far, thunderstorms build up a charge imbalance, which is in the, in the vicinity of hydrometeors, somehow triggers streamer discharges. Streamer discharges somehow produce a leader. Leaders somehow extend and branch. Once they reach the ground, somehow attaching to it, they trigger a return stroke but that's not the end of the story. Somehow return strokes come in groups 
And even when you're not seeing sort of bursty return stroke activity, you can even see bursts of activity when the channel is otherwise quiet. After all of this happens, eventually, where eventually now means some small fraction of a second, maybe a few seconds at most, the system sort of runs out of energy and quiets down. <coughs> the problems that I mentioned, how do thunderstorms electrify? How do we observe what's going on inside the cloud? How does lightning get started? How does the channel extend once it does get started? How does it connect to the ground? Why do we have multiple return strokes? And what causes these bursts of activity when we're not looking at multiple return strokes? Those are some of the main problems in lightning physics right now. To tell you a little bit about the current research, uh, I'm going to tell you a little bit about some lab experiments that myself and others have done to study sparks, small scale lightning discharges in the lab just to see how they work and what they, be, what they do. There's also a lot of opportunities for field research in this field um, to go and observe lightning in nature and figure out how it behaves in nature. We can also do a lot of good stuff just sitting in front of a computer. So I'll tell you about some simulation projects that I'm working on. And finally, I'll tell you about rocket-triggered lightning, just because it's awesome. As far as lab experiments go, these are some experiments that I did in January at the Technical University of Eindhoven. Sparks produce radiation. And that's a puzzle, because nothing about the spark would suggest that it's intense enough to produce radiation. If you think about the th sorts of things that typically produce radiation, namely particle accelerators, we didn't try to make a particle accelerator here. This is just a spark. Extremely high temperatures can also make radiation. They were talking about the sorts of temperatures that would be present at the center of the sun, not even the surface of the sun, and this is nowhere near hot enough to do that. But somehow energetic radiation is being produced. So the experiments that we're doing is, are looking into the statistics of this radiation. For instance, each of these little pencil-like structures is a radiation detector that when energetic radiation strikes, the detector produces a small flash of light. That flash of light is picked up and carried by these fiber optic cables to sensitive photodetectors, which are over here in an electromagnetic protection cabinet to shut out the vast quantities of electrical noise produced by the spark when it actually discharges. What we see when we look at these detectors after the spark happens is something like this. These are signals from our detectors. There's a good deal of structure here. Every time you see a little positive pulse here, there's some energetic radiation hitting one of our detectors. We're looking at four different detectors. Each panel here shows a different detector. And the detectors all see different things. They see different time structure, and they see different spatial structure as well. For instance, detector two here was hit fairly strongly at, the, at this time, whereas detectors one and three were not hit nearly as strongly. Whereas for this event, all four detectors saw something. So there's some geometry here that we're able to sort of tease out by looking at these <laughs> signals in detail. I have about five gigabytes of this data, and if anyone is looking for a summer project, I would be happy to have the help. Uh, another way that we're looking at how sparks and lightning produce radiation, uh, this is some experiments done at the Florida Institute of Technology by Joe Dwyer, another one of my colleagues. He is sort of the man in lightning research now. And he's built this. This is a pinhole X-ray camera. It's actually a pinhole high-speed X-ray movie camera that tells you about where x-rays are coming from with extraordinarily high time resolution. We're talking about million or a few million frames per second. It's not a particularly high resolution camera, but if you point it at the sky, where you expect lightning to strike this tall tower in an otherwise flat field, you can occasionally see something like this when you get lucky. The tower here is shown in the bottom, and the yellow line here represents where they think the lightning channel was as it came down to strike the tower. The intensity of the color here represents the intensity of the radiation that struck their camera, struck whatever pixel of their camera, tells them where they expect that radiation to be coming from. The first panel on the left shows as the lightning channel is approaching their tower, and the panel on the right shows once the lightning channel has reached the tower. So whereas on the left you see a relatively local, very intense emission, once the channel has reached the tower, you see a very broad sort of emission coming from all over the place. How you explain this has a lot to do with the charge structure in lightning and what exactly happens once the lightning channel reaches the ground. And we're working out the details as we speak, really. Uh, I wish Joe the best as he continues his analysis of this data. This is a really exciting experiment that tells us a lot about what actually happens when lightning comes towards the ground. If you're looking at these things in the field, of course, you can also point a high-speed camera at them. 
Um, this is another experiment done also at, the, at Florida Institute of Technology where they pointed a high-speed camera and got extraordinarily lucky because this is not a very large field of view. And they're shooting at an extremely high frame rate. This is 300,000 frames per second now. So each one of these frames is really only three <coughs> microseconds long. And that's the time scales you need in order to resolve the short processes that happen as the lightning channel extends. What's especially interesting from this perspective, consider this sort of right channel as time goes on. First, now since this is shown in reverse color, darker colors indicate a brighter channel, you have sort of a bright channel that gets less bright and then gradually less bright. But in this least bright frame here sort of in the middle, there's something brighter still that appears ahead of the channel. This is called a space stem, and we don't really know what it is. The best guess is that it's sort of a proto-channel that appears ahead of the main channel and then grows backwards to connect. And then once it connects, the overall channel gets even brighter. So this is, to my knowledge, the first time that we've, in natural lightning, really seen a good picture of what happens as the lightning channel extends. Somehow, something happens ahead of the channel that grows backwards towards the main channel. This potentially explains those bursts of activity, the pulses that I showed you when I said that natural lightning does not extend continuously, whereas most of what we see in the lab does extend continuously. So given information like that, it would be useful to make some predictions. Um, simulation, of course, pretty much everything in science these days has simulation or modeling involved to some extent. And since this is a physics research talk, I had to put in at least one equation, and it's a doozy. This is the electric field integral equation. The bottom line here is, you probably recognize this as Coulomb's law. This is charge density divided by distance squared times Coulomb's constant, only more complicated. What this allows us to do is, in full generality, calculate the electric field in the time-varying structures that occur in a lightning channel. So we can calculate the electric field. Suppose we had a channel, we could find the field. Knowing the field, we can find how the currents evolve. Knowing the currents, we can find how the charges evolve. And then we can repeat this whole process and allow the overall channel to extend by adding some statistical mechanisms, some stochastic processes that determine how the channel might extend. The net result here is we have the full time evolution simulated to the best of my, at least, understanding of how the lightning process behaves. Simulations like this are really only informative when they don't work. But in spite of that, I'm still kind of happy with the fact that they actually do work occasionally. This is simulation results from the model I just described. And when I play this, you'll see the lightning channel extend. And after a few milliseconds of extension, it quiets down. Maybe that looks like the sort of stuff that you saw in the movie. But after a while, it extends again. So burst of activity after 20 milliseconds or so of being quiet. That's the sort of process that I described as a K-change. And like I said, while simulations are really only informative when they don't work because they tell you that you've got something wrong, when they do work, they don't tell you nearly as much. But when they do work, they can make nice movies that you can show at your talks. <laughs> simulations like this are really not all that much use unless you have data. And, well, I have plenty of data. I've already showed you this data several times now. The left now is the data, whereas what happens on the right, the right panels, are my attempt to reproduce this data with the simulation. So, again, we're looking at the changes in electric field due to motions of charge, due to radiated electromagnetic fields produced as the lightning channel extends. And on the right, we're looking at that same sort of data as, produ or as simulated by my model. And you can see a couple of features that agree, more or less, right away. You see this sort of gentle curvature downwards, gentle curvature downwards. You see a burst of noisy stuff happening at the beginning, burst of noisy stuff happening in the beginning. After a while, it quiets down. After a while, it quiets down. If I put my imaginary detector in a different location, I can reproduce the behavior of the real detectors at different locations. And of course, since this is a simulation, I can tell you everything about what happened in this simulation. For instance, I can tell you something that would never be measurable, namely the current at the center of the channel where the lightning channel initiated. Uh, there's a lot of structure to the current here that is not picked up in the data. And um, hopefully, by looking at the data and looking at the current and looking at all the things the simulation can tell us, we'll be able to infer even more accurately what's actually going on here. 
If you look on a finer time scale at these individual pulses, we can model those as well. Now focusing a much higher time resolution simulation on individual pulses, looking just on the first three milliseconds of the data shown at the top. And then the data now is shown in black and the simulation results, my best attempt at reproducing the data, is shown in orange on top. And there are a variety of structures that you see in the data and I can get a variety of structures out of my simulation. Like I, kept, like I was saying earlier, these simulations are really only useful when they don't work. And here's a situation where they didn't quite work. This pulse fits well there, fits well there, but doesn't quite go back to the same place that the natural lightning went back to. What's going on there? It means I've, in, I've not included some facet of what was going on in nature in my simulation. And that's, to me, the most interesting part. What did I forget? Because that tells me that there is something relevant happening here that I don't understand yet. And the process of going from simulations that don't quite work to simulations that do work, that's where we learn the most when we're doing simulations. Oh. And I also promised you something on rocket-triggered lightning. Rocket-triggered lightning is what happens when right before a thunderstorm really gets going, you launch a wire with a rocket. These are not particularly complicated rockets. They're like high-end consumer grade model rockets. They have like big engines, but nothing that you need a special permit to buy. You launch a wire. As the rocket goes up, it trails the wire behind it. And if you're lucky, maybe one in every four times, the lightning channel will start growing from the wire upwards towards the cloud. The growth of that channel is nothing like the initiation process that happens in natural lightning. And rocket-triggered lightning like this is therefore nothing like what we would actually expect natural lightning to be like. It's generally much less intense, and of course it only happens when we trigger it. But the nice part about it is now we know where to point our cameras. So we can do high-speed photography, we can do the uh, X-ray high-speed movies that I showed you earlier from Joe Dwyer's group. That was actually a triggered lightning flash. Another reason I really like rocket-triggered lightning is you can take these amazing photographs. This is now looking very close to where the rocket was launched from, the launch tower here. Each of these tubes contains a rocket, and they'll do many shots when they're attempting to trigger lightning. And when they're successful, the rocket goes up. Eventually, the lightning channel starts growing. As it grows, as it extends towards the cloud, growing upwards and upwards and upwards, it eventually en encounters more intense electrical environments, more free charge, stronger electric fields. The currents carried along the wire and the lightning channel grow to the point where the wire itself vaporizes. And that's what you're looking at here, is the vaporization process of the wire. The colors you're seeing here are characteristic of the elemental composition of, well, the exhaust left behind by the rocket engine, if you're talking about the orange down at the bottom, and the greenish color here comes from the copper in the wire. The reason this is a sheet instead of a single channel is, well, wind. The whole process takes place over the course of maybe half a second to a second, and if you've got a decent wind speed of 10 miles an hour or so, a few meters per second, the channel will be blown since it's just existing in the air. As the air moves, the channel moves. Your camera, of course, doesn't move, so it sees a sheet-like sort of extension as, this, uh, as the process moves. So that's about all I have for you guys. Um, I promise to talk about the future. Um, lightning protection, I mentioned earlier, is a, a very big field. Um, maybe we could do lightning protection with rockets since, well, that would be pretty cool. <laughs> nope, unfortunately that doesn't work. It's like trying to prevent an earthquake by jumping up and down. There's way too much energy in the thunderstorm to ever prevent, unless, to prevent a significant amount of lightning unless you were launching rockets constantly and that would be prohibitively expensive. Uh, laser triggered lightning hasn't happened yet, but if you had an extraordinarily intense laser, the environment of the laser beam itself is not all that different than the environment of the lightning channel. So if you fire a laser beam upwards into a thunderstorm, maybe it would trigger a lightning discharge to follow the laser beam. Hasn't happened yet though. Uh, getting an energetic enough laser is, uh, well, a research project in its own right. Maybe we could somehow harness the energy of lightning. Sadly, that's not going to happen either. While lightning is an extraordinarily powerful phenomenon, it is very, very short-lived. Even if you could harness all of the energy dissipated in lightning globally, it would only add up to a few hundred megawatts. It wouldn't even power a mid-sized city. Most of the energy in a thunderstorm goes into those updrafts, goes into lifting prodigious quantities of water to very high elevations. So hydroelectric power is a much better bet than looking at the power stored in lightning. Ball lightning, also still somewhat embarrassingly an active area of research, I'm going to go ahead and say no. The reason I say no here is that almost all of our accounts of ball lightning nowadays are either very obviously crackpots or are historical. 
And given the fact that pretty much everyone is carrying a camera these days, we ought to have lots and lots and lots of video footage of ball lightning popping up. And it ought to be very easy to find. You ought to be able to go on YouTube and search for ball lightning and come up with hundreds of examples instead of coming up with hundreds of crackpots. Um, practical applications, though, we've got plenty of those. Uh, electrical discharge physics is a very big field, especially if you're talking about plasma processing. The uh, chemical processes that happen if you have a plasma are the same sort of processes that happen as part of a lightning discharge. So if we understand lightning, we understand better how to make, um, for instance, air cleaners. Uh, one of my colleagues at the Technical University of Eindhoven in the Netherlands is working on making a plasma processor to effectively remove NOx from uh, the air that occurs in uh, long tunnels. You have lots of cars driving through tunnels under the mountains. You have lots of exhaust building up. The air quality gets very poor very fast. So either you invest in very large fans to continually blow air into one end of the tunnel and out of the other, or you make do with the air that you have. And that's a much better idea since you can get by just with removing a few trace pollutants. And if you can efficiently chemically remove those pollutants, plasma processing being one of the ways to do that, you can reprocess the air and make it breathable, make it safe once again. High intensity gas discharge lamps, and we may actually have one in the projector there, are um, another active area of research. How do we make very efficient lamps? Discharge lamps use essentially the physics of an electrical discharge to produce light, and that turns out to be much more efficient than using the physics of getting a little piece of metal really, really hot. Instead of metal, you're getting a gas really, really hot, and the emission processes can be much more efficient. What else did I have? Uh, discharge prevention, of course. If you've got a discharge in the lamp, you want it to be a discharge in the lamp, not a discharge in the projector. So how do you stop a discharge from happening? If we understand how discharges happen, we can do a better job of preventing them from happening. Lightning protection is a very, very big field now. It's been a while since you heard about something like an oil refinery getting struck by lightning and exploding in a massive fireball. People care about lightning protection. And unfortunately, we can't do a very good job with it. One of the ways that engineers design lightning protection systems is essentially to scuff their feet on a carpet and walk up to a building and touch it, only on a more you know, engineering kind of technical scale. Charge up a really big capacitor and then discharge it on the roof of the building and watch where the current that flows in the building actually goes. It's difficult to predict, it's difficult to understand, and if we could build up a better understanding of how lightning actually happened, it would be much easier to build lightning protection systems. Finally, one of the main aspects, or main interesting things that has shown up only in recent years is uh, severe weather now casting. Uh, now casting is not so much a forecast as telling you what's about to happen in the next 10 to 15 minutes. Uh, think something along the lines of a tornado warning. Um, it's not telling you that a thunderstorm is coming three hours in advance, but it's going to tell you, go inside now, bad shit is about to happen. <laughs> and I told myself I wasn't going to swear. <laughs> All right. Um, there's lots more things that you can do with this, but what I'd like to leave you with here is, well, if you look closely, even at something relatively mundane, like a thunderstorm, you can go quite a ways down the rabbit hole. There's a lot of really interesting physics right under our noses. And I can't pretend to understand everything, but I'll do my best to answer questions. Thank you. This, incidentally, is a movie shot from the International Space Station stitched together in a time lapse. The little white flashes you're looking at are active thunderstorms. Questions? Brendan. I'm watching a video it looks like lightning is... So there's activity that's centered around a point. Is that just coincidence or...? Uh, what's difficult to interpret here, and you can see it especially clearly if you look at the bottom of the image at these lights, they're sort of streaks. These are time exposures. So each one of these dots that appears on the top of a thundercloud is probably an independent lightning discharge that was relatively localized. Viewing lightning from the top, you can't really get a very good picture of what happens since all you're seeing is sort of the bulk light output after it's scattered and diffused its way out of the cloud. But um, there's lots of good physics to be done by looking down at lightning. Uh, the lightning imaging sensor on board the Tropical Rainfall Measuring Mission is one of the great, uh, great experiments in lightning physics. They made a, a global lightning map from which we get statistics like every second there's about 50 lightning discharges. And um, the cartoon I led with, how to or try to hit Florida, 
or see if you can hit Florida. Um, Florida has it easy compared to the Congo Basin. Unfortunately, the Congo Basin is not a very good place to do science, but the infrastructure is a little lacking. But uh, they have very, very high lightning flash density. Otherwise, most intense lightning on the Earth happens in Kansas, of all places. But that's intense lightning, not frequency of lightning. And not a question so much as an observation for the benefit of the students. I, I like your point that you learn the most by having your simulations fail. Because, let's face it, in, in research, failure is where we learn the most. And, and, and yet, in the classroom, we're often you know, feel anxious about failure, like, oh my gosh, I've made a mistake, that's the most terrible thing ever. And I, I, I'd like to reinforce this message that it's in failure where we learn the most, where we actually you know, can advance the most in science overall. And there is always an option. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, I was interested in your uh, the, the the early early plot of the three dimensional nature of the spatial distribution of the lightning over time. This is a, yeah that very uh, is lightning typically linear in all three dimensions like that, or can it sort of be more you know sort of ball like I guess and more you know basically you see you see lines in all three dimensions there is that Typical. Uh, this was an atypical discharge because it was so big, but <clears throat> otherwise this is reasonably typical. If, if you look in the side view, this is now altitude versus east-west, whereas this is altitude versus north-south. This is more or less a sheet, so it's really not extended in three dimensions. And if you think about the charge structure in a thunderstorm, I drew this as a sort of small-scale thunderstorm, but if this were, you know, 50 kilometers wide instead of 10 kilometers wide, you would get these large sheet-like regions of charge. So probably what's happening here is there's an extended region of charge, probably the upper positive charge region, mm -hmm. in a large thunderstorm where there was a, a sort of central negative charge region over here, and you had a discharge started that since it had so much charge available in the upper positive, it ended up connecting to ground and, and extending and extending and extending and extending, transferring very, very large quantities of charge. But lightning follows the charge. It's a discharge process, after all. So more or less, you can look at this as a map of the charge region in the thunderstorm. So it's subject to the same sort of meteorological processes. If I go to the simulation results, um, this is not nearly as extended in a horizontal dimension. This looks like a much more horizontal sort of process. Yeah. Um, Simulations like this, it's hard to make them run on a very long time scale. The computer runs out of memory and the simulation gets slower and slower and slower and slower. Um, if I let this run, and I've run simulations on, on longer scales than this, it does tend to start following the charge distribution. But actually understanding why lightning looks like this sort of structure is not really all that easy to understand. There's no direct reason the lightning should follow the charge. The lightning should follow the electric field. And following the electric field and following the charge are different. So my simulations tend to follow the field very strongly, whereas natural lightning perhaps is doing something slightly different. It's hard to tell. Good question, though. Uh, is there any explanation for the lightning out of the blue sky phenomenon? Bolts from the blue. Um, I should have put a picture of a thundercloud in this somewhere. Um, bolt from the blue lightning. <coughs> You can think of it as sort of like a positive cloud to ground lightning like this, where the lightning channel exits the cloud, sort of bypassing some of the cloud structures. Um, bolt from the blue lightning is never very far from a thunderstorm. So it comes from a clear blue sky, but if you look in that direction, you'd see there was a thunderstorm. So you really shouldn't have been surprised. <laughs> Bolts never happen completely from the blue. But yeah, understanding why and under what circumstances bolt from the blue lightning happen is an interesting question. Um, for instance, I drew this horribly implausible channel starting somewhere around here probably and then growing into the upper positive and down to ground. Why wouldn't it go to the negative charge region? It's right there. Um, this isn't a complete picture of the charge structure in a thunderstorm. The actual picture is a good deal more complicated. It's not just the central updraft. You have downdrafts. You have lateral wind shear, of course. Um, in addition to that, the air surrounding the thundercloud is a much better conductor than the thundercloud itself. 
So you've got plenty of free ions and electrons in the air surrounding the thundercloud, and those ions will drift under the influence of the electric field of the thunderstorm until they hit the thunderstorm. So essentially, you can think of the upper reaches of the storm here having a layer of charge that they've picked up from the surrounding air. And the influence of that charge distribution is probably important in explaining bolt from the blue lightning. If you end up with, say, an especially high concentration of charges that have accumulated on the side of the thunderstorm, having seen this positive charge, you would get a bunch of negative charges accumulating here. Maybe then you can have a very intense electrical environment there that then leads to a lightning discharge that connects your upper positive with something. But then it's ran out of charge here, and all it's got left is to go to ground. I'm, I'm like I said, vig vigorously waving my hands, but yeah, good question. Sarah? Uh, you were talking about the importance of this study as far as preventing accidents. And I was curious, I noticed that in your, your problem list, you sort of end at the point when the lightning hits the tree. Mm -hmm. uh, and as someone who likes to go hiking in places where there are lightning, I know that often people who are injured aren't hit directly. They're, they're injured by the ground current. So I'm wondering, is, do we understand that process of how, what happens to that? energy once it hits the tree, where it goes, how it moves to the surface, or is that a whole another list of problems? That's probably associated with the problems of lightning protection. I got an email from a guy a couple of months ago now asking if I had any idea what would happen if there was a cable buried around here. Um, it's the same sort of problem. There are going, whatever current is flowing in this channel, once it hits the ground, is going to spread out in all directions. And if you're standing, say, here, you'll get a shock. Not nearly as bad as if you were climbing the tree, but you'll get a shock all the same because you're close enough. Um, if you notice the, the telephone pole with the channel leaving here, even if you're standing near, the, near where the lightning is going to strike, you may actually get struck in some sense because you'll develop your own channel going upwards towards the lightning like, ooh, ooh, pick me, pick me. But yeah, there's, a, there's probably some complicated physics there. I haven't thought about it though. That's a good question. You've got a pretty good list of problems to work on. <laughs> As far as your simulations go, are there um, parameters that you're assuming um, that, is there like a holy grail of something measurable that would parameterize your simulations that much more accurately? Um, like I look at Rho. Yeah. Yes, there is. And that uh, is the charge distribution on the channel as a function of radius away from the channel. Um, for instance, all I've shown you here is, well, there's a channel and there's some charges on the channel. In an actual lightning channel, the charge is not on the channel. The channel itself is only about a centimeter in diameter. So you can't store very much charge on that before the repulsion fo repulsive forces just between that charge and itself cause the charge to migrate outwards. So the lightning channel itself is surrounded by a sheath of charge. And understanding the dynamics of that sheath of charge is really important for understanding the time structure, the fine time structure especially. If I go to the simulation results here, each pulse here has sort of a downward side and an upward side. The downward side is due to the current turning on as you extend the channel, and the upward side is due to the current turning off after you've extended the channel, after the charge has stopped flowing onto the new channel. And the amplitude of each pulse is proportional to the rate at which that turn on and turn off process happens. So here you've turned on the current very rapidly, but then you turn off the current much less rapidly. And the structure here of these pulses, you have to, have to understand how that charge migrates. The turning on, that's charge flowing onto the channel. It's a narrow channel, it's a compact object, it fills with charge rapidly, things happen fast. But then when you're turning off the channel, turning off the current, there you want to know when you've filled this extended volume of space that surrounds the channel with charge. And knowing how that process happens is, that would really help. <laughs> Let's just say that much. You had a question? Uh, yeah, for the return strokes after lightning hits the ground, mm -hmm. do, do those all come from the ground and go to the cloud, or is it sort of a back and forth thing between the cloud and the ground? Really good intuition. Um, it's actually a back and forth. The initial lightning discharge, let me go back to my movies. Uh, I'll go to the slow one now. The initial lightning discharge as it grows downwards towards the ground, you know, branching outwards, Etc. No, too slow. I'm impatient. Once it hits the ground, you get uh, the return stroke. So you had that sort of slow growth process and then a very fast return stroke. Um, if I hadn't truncated this movie, you'd see this channel get a little bit dimmer, 
and then get brighter again, and then it'll get a little dimmer, and then get brighter. That's not a return stroke, subsequent return stroke phenomenon. That's what's called continuing current. Once it reached the ground, it just sort of stayed active for 100 milliseconds or so. Um, in the case of this figure, there was no continuing current. Once it struck, there was just done. Probably what's happening here, you lit up the channel, there was a lot of charge transferred. The charge that's transferred is charge that was stored on the channel locally. So once you've drained that charge, no need to keep conducting, no need to keep the channel active. So in this period of time when there's nothing happening on the channel, there's really nothing happening on the channel. Nothing, ha nothing is happening here locally. Up in the cloud, however, there's a lot going on. It's not the end of the story up in the cloud. The map that I showed at the beginning where you had this very extended network of channels, those channels continue to grow. And as they continue to grow, they continue to accumulate charge. And that charge wants to go somewhere. It can't just go straight to the ground, though, because the channel here has more or less died. It's not hot anymore. It's cooled off. It's dissipated. It's been blown around by the wind. It's been disconnected in some sense. But once there's enough stuff happening up in the cloud to reactivate that channel, that reactivation cha process starts in the cloud, works its way down the channel, and then the whole channel lights up once again. Um, the process that starts in the cloud and propagates down the sort of defunct channel is called a dart leader, as opposed to the stepped leader, which is what we see in the, in the high-speed movies like this. But that dart leader subsequent return stroke process is initiated by something that we don't really understand happening in a region we can't really observe. <laughs> More questions? When it comes to your simulations, like how do you make them more natural in a sense? Because if you're in the laboratory versus like outside, like how do you make your simulations? How do I make my simulations natural? Well, there are a lot of ways that I've tried to make this simulation natural. One is by using the electric field integral equation. The electric field integral equation doesn't care what the geometry of the channel is. So I can use any channel geometry I want. Uh, there are lightning simulations that work more or less on a chessboard, on a grid, in three dimensions, where everything is either east, north, or up, or west, south, and down, obviously. But if you're working on a grid like that, you're never going to reproduce the true geometry of natural lightning. So I've tried to break a dependence on the geometry there. Um, I've also tried to break a dependence on an explicit time step, since there's a lot of different time scales that are relevant to the things that happen in lightning. The electric field integral equation doesn't really care about the time scale either. Uh, it can treat whatever time scales you're interested in. The leftmost term here I pointed out was what you were familiar with from physics class, like charge divided by distance squared times Coulomb's constant. The other, the other terms here, you notice, have time derivatives in them. That's, those are important when you have things that are changing rapidly with time. So not only does this equation encapsulate the slow processes, it also encapsulates the fast processes. Not working in a grid also frees me from worrying about having a strict time step for the system. So I can actually do adaptive time stepping with this. I can take long time steps when things are boring and short time steps when they're exciting. Uh, otherwise, trying to include as many properties of the channel as possible is, uh, is important. One of the graduate students at Stanford, San Liang, who picked up this project where I left it off after I got my PhD, is working on adding a full gas dynamics chemistry model to the channel. So instead of just having a segment of charge or a segment of current, which is what I've been working with, he has a segment of charge, a segment of current, a segment of electron density, a segment of temperature, a segment of nitrogen ion density of first excited state nitrogen density. Like He's tracking all of these chemical properties of the channel as they evolve. And it actually turns out to be reasonably important, which is kind of making me kick myself for not trying to include them sooner. But trying to make the simulation more and more natural means including more and more physical parameters of how the channel itself behaves and how the charges themselves migrate. Really, in principle, all of the fundamental laws of physics that are relevant to this phenomenon are completely known. But the way they interact is not at all well understood. And I don't think anyone, given chemistry and thermodynamics and electricity and magnetism and plasma physics would have predicted thunderstorms and lightning. So I don't feel too bad about that fact. Um, when you were showing the uh, diagram of like the, when you, the electrical argon and uh, the different elements, mm -hmm. so like if there's different um, elements of gas within the channel, would the structure of lightning change then? If there were different elements in the lightning channel, would the structure of the lightning channel change? Uh, I'm going the wrong direction. 
that was back when I talked about talking about streamers. Yes, it might. Um, we're not going to be working with a pure argon atmosphere anytime soon when it comes to Earth, nor are we going to be working with a pure, ox pure nitrogen atmosphere. Um, the nitrogen-oxygen mixing ratio actually turns out to be quite important, too. So the chemical properties and, and how they affect the discharge process overall are interesting, um, especially if you're thinking about lightning on Jupiter or lightning on Venus, where the chemical composition of the atmosphere is different. There are sessions on that at conferences <laughs> that you can go to where they talk about the effects of the chemical composition on possible lightning. I don't think there's any real consensus as to whether or not there is lightning on Venus, but we know there's lightning on Jupiter and lightning on Saturn, so why not? Is all lightning necessarily visible? Is all lightning necessarily visible? Ooh, really good question. There is, there are events called, <laughs> I kid you not, dark lightning. Um, it's, a, it's a relatively new idea. Really, it's, it has nothing to do with lightning so much as it has to do with production of very large bursts of energetic radiation. So it's possible. There are also types of lightning, or at least types of electrical activity, that if you go and look at, I know I'll get to data sooner or later here, if you go and look at data like this, occasionally you see something like this, very intense pulse, and you detect it with your radio receivers, and you know it came from a thunderstorm right over there, like 10 kilometers away, but instead of seeing a lightning discharge associated with it, you just see a flat line. Nothing, but then there was a pulse. Um, those are narrow bipolar events, and we have absolutely no idea what they are. So I could have kept going in terms of listing problems, but <laughs> I've, ran, I've ran over already. Yeah. Um, I've also noticed in the structure of lightning where as like the, they scatter across, um, it also, almost looks in relation to like a neuron or a nerve. Mm -hmm. And um, I was just curious like if, um, once it hits the ground and you see it light up like that, is it, could you relate that to like you touching like a desk and like the reaction of that going to your brain? Kind of like in the sense of the clouds, the brain and the lightning. Mm -hmm. the... That's a good connection. I haven't thought about it in that way. The geometry of neurons and neural networks is certainly similar to the sort of geometry that you get from a lightning discharge. I'm not sure if there's a sound physical or biological reason for that. But, yeah, the, the motion of charge on a channel once it touches the ground is going to be similar to the motion of charge in, you know, the conductive channels in your body as, as charges move on conductive channels. It's all just charge moving on conductive channels. Yeah? Would the concentration of ozone change as uh, uh, right around the lightning channel or within the cloud itself as lightning is being born? Lightning and ozone. <clears throat> um, yes. In principle, lightning makes ozone. I don't think it's all that dominant a source, but I haven't dug into the atmospheric chemistry of lightning very much personally. I know there are people that have done a lot of research along those lines. And um, one thing I can tell you, and this is very speculative, large lightning discharges like this one move so much charge that if you're looking at the space above the thunderstorm, they make a very large electric field above the thunderstorm, and you can, call, and you can induce something that I like to think of as space-to-cloud lightning where it starts in the conductive upper, upper atmosphere, about 80 kilometers altitude, instead of this, which is, well, 8 kilometers altitude. And you get a discharge process that works its way downwards, instead of working its way upwards or working its way horizontally. And those are called sprites. They were named that because people didn't know exactly what they were working with, so they gave them some sort of whimsical name. And people have looked into whether or not sprites would be relevant to production of ozone or, to, or destruction of ozone when it comes down to it, because they're happening at the right altitudes for affecting the ozone layer. But to my knowledge, there's no convincing evidence that they have any effect. They actually end up being too rare. Large lightning discharges like this don't happen often enough. As far as what happens closer to the ground, more run-of-the-mill sorts of lightning discharges, sure, why not? All right, well, if there's no other questions, thanks. Thanks to everyone for coming.